All right, everybody, welcome back to a uh, Glenn and Hammer Swarm with a Real Estate of Mind podcast. Uh, go ahead. I just yeah, let, let me start over again. What the hell just, is that? I don't know. It's amateur hour for me, apparently. Let's start over again. Here we go. All right. Speaking all right. Of, speaking all of right. messes. I wasn't. It was Nick's fault. I was already ready to roll before. And I'm all off my game now, so it's okay. It's a big deal. Today. All right. Let's go. All right. All right. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind Show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. Today's guest is pretty cool. This is something we, we don't really dive into a lot in our workshops. And I'm excited to talk to him today to learn more about how we can uh, make money on the deals that could be dead deals, right? We all get you know deals that come in that are deals that we have to turn away. And I'm excited about this. So we have uh, Nick Legamoro here, Nick, Nick Legamoro, and he's from uh, USA Note Pro. And uh, welcome, Nick. Glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. You've done uh, over 1,100 deals, I think you said, and like 70% of those are creative finance, right? Creative deal structures. Yeah, that's correct. That just shows you how old that I am. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do them all last year, I can tell you that. So yeah. I've been doing this since the early 2000s and uh, went through the the crash of 08 and live to tell about it. And a lot of my friends did it. Uh, right. They yeah. live, but they, they don't talk about it. That's for sure. Uh, but I was very fortunate to get out of that. But, you know, and back then uh, there wasn't a lot of what we're doing right now. We didn't, there wasn't the education and the podcasting and the YouTubes or right just the internet in general. Most of that data uh, people don't realize how good they have it with, what they have available to them today. We ain't and, got the truth. <laughs> oh my goodness. And if I, I, and I try to install that, instill that in my kids that are um, uh, young adults. My son is 19 and my daughter just is almost 22. And they, it's really difficult to understand and, and, and understand for them in today's technology and how readily available stuff is. And it just, but it's no different than my parents or your parents when they were growing up and they, you know, they dig, they dug the hole with the, with the shovel instead of using the backhoe, right? And then they had the backhoe. And so they, sh everybody should, <clears throat> I tell people that don't, don't, don't learn from, don't, you, there's no reason to learn from your mistakes. There's plenty of people that have already made the mistakes, learn from the people that have made the mistakes and use that to your advantage. And I love education, although I'm not a big educator uh, from that perspective, but education is, is such an integral part of just the whole growth process and be able to get from A to, a to Z in the most efficient, effective method. And that's why I love doing, uh, doing shows and talking, because if I can help somebody learn something new or just help them understand that there's, I always said, there's more than one way to get to Chicago, right? And what I mean by that, you can take a bus, you can ride a bike, you can take a train, you can walk. It, it really depends on what your, what your objective is or what your criteria is to make that decision. So information and education helps me, you make the best informed decision so that you can be successful in whatever business endeavor you're after. And it dramatically shortens the learning curve. Yeah, we always thousand percent. You know, a lot of people say that there's there's no there's no shortcut to success. Amber's kind of famous for always saying, "Well, there is. It's learning from other people. That's your shortcut, right?" Learning. Well, that's, look, that's I'm a per, look, I, I'm I've been in this space a long time, and I've been a professional in this space for many many years, and I still spend thousands of dollars a year to, to, on education. Yeah. I think. Um, uh, there's, it's just, it's an invaluable, it's invaluable because it, it just gets you to that, that end point so much quicker and you can invest time into what you want to do. You can invest money and some people have more time than money and some have more money than time, but you have to realize that you have to go get education. But the beauty of it is that this is education that we're giving them today and it doesn't cost them a nickel. Just take advantage of it. And it's all, it's 90% execution. You can learn a thousand different ways to make money in real estate. Honestly, there's, there, there's, oh yeah, you can, you can say, Hey, Nick, I want you to start a fix and flip business, or I want you to go uh, do apartments or what I, I can do any of them. It doesn't make a difference. It's all about the execution, find, you know, what you like to do and then figure out how to make money doing it. And that's where we are right now. Tell us what you do. Cause I like, I like the idea of notes. I like the, you know, creative deal structures. And I like when we were talking before you said, you want to be a, a lean Lord, not a landlord. Yeah, well, I that was pretty cool. I like to hear. I like to hear more about that. So really, all a lean. So people know what landlords are, right? I mean, sure. a landlord is somebody that owns a property and rents it out, and they have a tenant in there, and they get paid cash flow. That's the idea of a land of what a landlord does is buy cash flow, and whatever method is you take to get to that point, that's what they are, and that's what you see 
all over HGTV and Fix and Flop This and whatever. Those are all great shows. <laughs> fix and Flop. Fix and Flop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're called. No, I know. I, 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 got lots of, hey, I got lots of friends that are doing those, so I got to be yeah. careful which which name I throw out there. But like at the end of the day, I there, I teach people and I and I practice what I preach on how to be the bank. Right. That's really what this is about. And what I mean by that is how act and think how a bank does, because there's a reason why banks are the biggest buildings in every downtown that you go into. And, you know, there's a reason why they do that. They don't practice what they preach. They tell you to go put your money in a CD or go do something like that. What they do, they don't own real estate. They own zero real estate. They own, they control real estate and they control it by having a note or a mortgage on a property. They don't have, it's not their name on the deed. It's your name on the deed as the homeowner. And what I love about that is that, well, and here's the thing. If it's good enough for a bank, it's probably good enough for most people. I mean, if you can figure out how to emulate how a bank operates, then that's it. And that's why I like to be a lien lord. I like to control, not own. And the way I do that is by uh, putting liens and mortgages on properties that I, I create. Um, a lot of times out of thin air, if you want to know the truth, and we can sort of dive into that a little yeah. bit, but I've yeah. done. Um, so when I started doing mortgage notes is I, I started out like a, any, not anybody, but most people do in the wholesaler space. Right. I did. Cause back, I know I'm not going to go before 2008 uh, because well, before 2008, I didn't have all the information I have now. So I didn't know what I didn't know at the, and I learned a lot of things the wrong way. And I was very fortunate to get, get out of, the mess that was that, that that I was a part of as a result of people being ir, uh, irresponsible, for lack of a better word, in 2008, that caused the, yeah. the, the demise that we all were sure. oh, yeah, yeah. part of. And so <clears throat> I said, when I, I took it, I took a brief time off, I took about a year off from real estate, but I knew that real estate was really the, the key to wealth building and generational sure. wealth. There's no sure. question about it. And uh, so my, my go, I go, man, I can't go back and do what I did before because that, that wasn't a good model. I didn't have, I didn't have all the answers to the questions that I need to know to make sure it was successful. And so I really started thinking about it. And I, then at that time, by 2010, there was information. There was a lot of inf information on the internet. You didn't have to go down to the courthouse to pull your list, for example, to go find a property buy. And I really, wholesaling made it the most sense to me and it's still, it's a, it's the fundamental uh, real estate transaction because everything starts with a deal. I don't care if you're a lender, if you're a buy and hold investor, <clears throat> fix and flipper, uh, note, you know, you want to be at the bank. It has to start with a deal. Without a deal, you can't do anything, right? So wholesaling and, and wholesalers today are an integral part of any real estate business that you want to be a part of. So I got into that and... But I learned right away it was extremely transactional, and I knew that transactional wasn't the way you generated wealth. You had, you had to be, you had to, you know, Warren Buffett says you have to learn how to make money while you're sleeping, right? Basically, right. that's a paraphrase. And you don't make money while you're sleeping if you're doing fix and flips or if you're right. wholesale, Correct. right? It's a oh, transactional yeah, game. Yeah. So um, I started uh, um, just by by accident. Uh, I, I got I, I started getting into creative financing um, and as a result of that we would we would find properties to buy this is early on this is like the first 100 200 deals we'd find a property to buy we'd buy it we'd fix it then um, instead of selling it to a retail buyer through the traditional means we would sell it to an owner finance buyer mm -hmm. and we would we would own, we would sell, sell it owner financing uh, to somebody that was a hardworking family that couldn't go down to Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America and get a loan. And yeah. we would write the note to them. We would be the bank. And what we would have to do, uh, unfortunately, because we didn't know what we didn't know, and I wish I did, um, that I, what I know now, what I want to talk about, is we would sell that note. We would yeah. sell that note. We'd sell it at a discount. But the net effect of that of, of that whole transaction would still yield us more money than if we would have ever wholesale it or ever or sold it on a fix and flip model, uh, just because of the dynamics of the deal. Back then, when we first started it, it was a lot different because we were doing stuff in a hundred thousand dollar and below price points. We were doing stuff that was affordable housing for most 
uh, in most markets. And Nick, um, Nick, what year was this again? Or this was probably in 2010. Okay. Yeah. So right, right when it was still hard to get, it was really hard to get loans back. Yes, then. it was extremely hard yeah. to get. Not, so, you, so not only was it hard to get solved loans, the problem for a lot of people. Well, yeah, and we'll talk about mm. the, the numbers on that too, and where where I think it's even where it's going moving forward. Yes. But in yeah. 2010, not only could you not, it was really difficult to get to get financing, um, but it was also banks did not like to lend. The, the small dollar amounts. It was really hard to go get an $80,000 loan. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't a lot of lenders back then that would do that. Nowadays, that same $80,000 house that was in like Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, it's a $160,000, $170,000 house now. Right. Yeah. So we would go, uh, so, you know, we would write these, we would write these notes and we would sell the notes and that's how we would be able to provide that. And, you know, then fast forward to where we are today. Well, so I did that. We built this whole company called Rilex Capital. My partner and I, uh, John Montero, some of you guys may know John Montero. He's a, he's big in the multifamily space now, but we built this company back in the, in the, you know, 2010, 11, 12, and we eventually sold it. We sold, we built it to sell. We didn't know that we would sell it, but not only did we sell it, we sold it to a, a, a chartered bank. So a bank actually came in and bought this creative financing company that we created because they couldn't do it. They couldn't do what we were able to do because of regulations and compliance and all the other things that banks are, you know, not allowed to do. Yeah, they're required. Um, yeah. They can buy these notes all the time. So we started thinking about it and we started going, well, what if I could figure out uh, how to stay in these deals longer term? Okay. So for okay. example, let's talk about the wholesaler model because most people probably understand wholesaling as that goes. If you go find a house, let's use a hundred thousand uh, dollar number, okay? Even though there's not a lot of whole hundred hundred thousand uh, dollar houses out there any any longer, but let's just say that's the sale price of the house. If you're a wholesaler and you're going to go buy that uh, or control that property with the contract, you're going to probably need to be in that in today's environment at what? Give me give me an idea. Was it 80, 80, grand. 80 cents? Let's repairs, right? Sure. Yeah. So if it's got a twenty thousand dollar a repair bill on it, rehab number, then you need to buy that house at around $60,000. Sure. And you might get what? Maybe a $5,000 wholesale fee on, it, fee on that? Yeah, 10, by 10 probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, this would be conservative. Where you're at. Right, yeah, right, right now, yeah. it might just be more than that. Yeah, yeah right now, the, yeah. The the argument, let's call it 10. Let's call yeah. it 10. Okay, so that job, that just that is a transaction. You did all the work and now you're going to get $10,000 when you flip that contract to another buyer. Now let's take that person that just bought that property, right? That buyer of that property is probably who? Somebody hasn't been fixed yet, right? It's probably another investor. Another investor, right? sure. Yeah. Most of the time. Of course. So what is that investor going to do? Well, he's gonna fix the property and he's gonna sell the property and he's gonna sell it for retail, okay? He's gonna to wanna to make a profit on it as well because he's an investor. That's what investors do. So let's look at it from the role of the fix and flip guy now. So now the fix and flip guy got it from the wholesaler because that's where a lot of fix and flip guys get their deals from. Sure. And so now he bought it for 70, right? Yeah. Yep. He puts 20 into it. Okay. So now he's at 90. He's probably not selling that deal at, at 100, but let's just say it's um, 110. Okay. Sure. So yep. now he's going to make his, you know, less cost of repairs. He can make 10. Fifteen thousand dollars, maybe. I mean, right. less less is cost of cost of capital and things like that. Mm -hmm. So where we could come in is that we instead of being that 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 middle guy, we eliminate the middle guy. We come in and we do that repairs, and but we're selling it on terms. So right. let's just take that same hundred ten thousand dollar price point. We would take a hundred ten thousand dollar sale price. We would do the work, right? But we would sell that and we get ten percent down because mm -hmm. that's what we. That's just a good number. And then we'd have a hundred thousand dollar note. Okay. Nick, are you selling at retail price now or in yes. the future when they're when they're gonna buy it? Retail price. No, we're now. gonna sell it at retail. So once we finish this the, the property, we're selling it at, at retail price. And right they now. are taking tight they're taking title to it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's a full most of the time. Full, most of the, of the time. Most, sure. most of the time we are we are transferring deed of uh we're, we're transferring the deed of ownership over. You're sure. getting your own title. And then we show up as the lien holder, right? We, we yep. show up as the bank. So in this example, um, we got $10,000 cash. Okay. We had a hundred thousand dollars in, in notes. And what we do, what I did, and it took me 500 deals to figure this out is that we go write a first and a second lien. And the reason why I write a first and second lien is for a couple reasons. Number one, um, it's, it's how I can maximize the profit on the deal. And we'll explain that in a second. So let's just, so I'll, let's say I write a $75,000 uh, 
um, first lien. Uh, let's, no, let's do uh, eighty thousand because it's one ten. Eighty thousand dollar first lien, twenty thousand dollar second lien, ten thousand dollar down payment. That's what I yeah. got. Okay. So I'll take that eighty thousand dollar first lien. Yeah. And I'll be able to sell that. Okay. So when I sell yeah. that first lien, I'm gonna have to discount it a little bit. Okay. Um, well, yeah, what's a typical discount on something like that? Let's listen to ten percent. Well, that's a great what's... question. It, it, it's it's a very it's a very subjective answer. And really, yeah. what it boils down to is how well is the borrower. File yeah. Bid, What's their strength? Right. Yeah. Did they? Did you pull a 1003? Did you do a 1003 application, for example? Are you servicing the <clears> note <throat> with a third-party servicer? Did mm -hmm. you? Uh, did you do a credit check? Is the property worth what you sold it for? Right. Is it in a, yeah. a lot of factors? It'd be no different than you going and buying a used car, right? You look sure. for a car that's used, and you go, oh, there's there's 10 Ford F-150 pickup trucks that meet what I'm looking for. But what do you do? You go out and look at each one of them and see, well, is it really what they say it is? Well, notes are no different and the file is no different. And But when we underwrite, it's no different than if they were to underwrite, go to a Bank of America or Chase to do the underwriting file. But getting back to, so the discount really is, a, is determined by how well that file is stacked. And that's what we, that's what we specialize in, making sure that we get the, the notes stacked as, as best as possible so we can get the highest um, uh, price for that note. But what we've done, because we're writing the first and the second, is that we eliminate a lot of that risk for the note buyer that's buying the first right, because right. they're only buying a 75% LTV note. Okay. For our listen, listeners, LTV is loan to value. And so if value. I just simplify, what you're doing yeah. is you're, you are selling off a portion of the finance to a third party to get cash back for your working capital. And then you are holding on to, let's say, 20% of the note or 10%, whatever it is. And that's your long-term play as well. So you're getting, you're getting income off of that at a regular interest rate, but a little higher interest rate than banks would give. Five, a lot six, higher six, interest rate, to be quite honest with you. And we can talk about that it? in a second. Okay, so let's good. go back to the first, and then I'm going to answer your question. So that 70, the first, when we sell the first, the objective when we create it is to wipe out all of our underlying debt that sure. we incurred while we did it. So sure. in this example, if we were the whole, if we were the wholesaler, we had that property at $60,000. We put 15 into the repairs. I think that was the yeah. number we used. So my cost basis is roughly $75,000 plus holding costs. Let's call it $80,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just sold that $80,000 first lien. Let's call it 75. Okay. So I'm, I, I'm, I've sold it for 75, but I owe 80, but I collected $10,000 on the down payment. So my net cash on the deal is about five grand in this example, but I'm left with a $20,000 second lien at 10% interest. That's my free and clear profit on the deal. So the face value is 25 grand on a hundred thousand dollar purchase, which is probably more than most people would be able to do on that deal. Okay. Questions. <laughs> Cause I know that was a lot real quick. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to put the brakes on for just a second and point something out to the listeners. And it goes back to how our podcast first started is that learning from other people's mistakes. And you said it took you 500 deals to figure that out. It doesn't need to take anybody else. 500 deals. God, no. well, two deals no, here's to figure the, that here's out. The, but here's the big, here's the big tech, the bigger takeaway in my opinion is that I didn't lose money on those deals. Not a matter of fact, we made a ton of money on those deals. What I'm saying is that we could have made a lot more money on those deals by just changing the way that we did them. Right. That's it. So in a way we lost because we already had the opportunity. Hence why we do what we do when we talked about the dead leads. You've People have already marketed to, to find a seller and they try to negotiate that price for a deal, right? And, and, and so if we can figure out another creative way to do that deal, I could very easily have paid in that model right there. Even when the wholesaler had on, I was at $60,000, but the model I just did, could I have bought that house? If I knew that the outcome was going to be what it is, could I pay $70,000 for that house? Could I pay $80,000 for the house? I, the answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get more deals with the same amount of, of deal flow. Or it, it was an in, interesting perspective too. I never quite thought about it that way. You know, the biggest building in any town is a bank and they, they actually don't own the real estate. They just control it. You, you basically are just looking at who's at the top of the food chain. Yeah. And, you know, becoming the king of the jungle. Well, banks don't put their yeah. money in banks. 
banks don't put their money in banks. They put our money out. They put it out to farm. They use they it. it. They leverage it. They get. Yeah. They get. They get ten times lending power on that yeah. money they, they that you put into the thing. So they get the. It's a crazy, crazy model, and there's no reason why. Here's the thing. I, I want to talk. I want to talk. I want to talk to, to a couple of, I think, are extremely important part, points right now, given where we are in the economy and just yeah. the landscape coming out of the pandemic, right? Number one, rates are historically low, right? There's no argument Crazy low. that. Okay. Crazy but here's some interesting, and this is why we do what we do. Um, even though rates are low, the number of people that can actually go get down to a Chase or a Wells Fargo or Bank of America or whoever it is to actually get a traditional mortgage is extremely small. It's a small number. It's less than 50%. It's might be, it might even be 60 or 65 percent people that cannot go get that loan. For example, I cannot go down to a bank because I own multiple companies and I get, and I get just, uh, distributions. I'm not a W2 employee. They don't like people like me. Even though right. I have five times the money in the bank to go buy that property for cash, they don't like me. It doesn't no. fit their, it doesn't fit their borrower box, right? Well, guess what? America is. It's not what the banks want them to be. It's everything else. There's a lot of people that are entrepreneurs that work for themselves that get paid, you know, multiple streams of income because of doing what they do. It just doesn't, it doesn't, they, they, it doesn't fit. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, uh, the, the second thing is banks control the rules of the game. And what I mean by that, hundred people go back to March of 2020 when the pandemic was just starting to, to, to come into play, right? Nobody really knew what it was. A hundred people that would have been that would the bank would have been qualified by the banks would have been approved. Okay. That same hundred people in August, three or four months later, that number dropped down to like 65 or 70 percent. And yeah. nothing changed, nothing changed on the borrower's side. Their job yep. didn't change, their income didn't change, their DTI, debt to income didn't change, credit score, didn't, nothing changed. What changed was the bank's comfort level with right. where we were. And that's the problem with where we, where we are today is that it's just extremely difficult to go get traditional financing. Nick, what do you think? You know, we, we've got, a, you know, everyone thinks they have a crystal ball, what's gonna happen. God knows, I, I wouldn't have thought we'd be where we are today. I thought when this started, it was gonna be, we were gonna see problems long before this with all the, um, foreclosures. Uh, foreclosures and all that coming in. I'm curious, you know, you have a perspective being in the business for a long time, like we do. What is your perspective on what do you think is going to happen coming down the road here? You know, and obviously no one knows, but what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, my, my microphone switched. I hope you can still hear me okay. I got you okay. there. You're good. All right. I, you know, forbearance has been, you know, keeping people afloat for, for a while, right? And that that can get and kicked down the to the road is going to come to an end. Okay. You feel like it has um, to, right? I mean, I keep, well, there's I no keep choice. It's going to have to. Let me tell you. Let me let me. Here's the thing about. Here's what I will tell you. Okay. And this is the. Here's another fundamental difference between landlords and lien lords. Okay. Landlords. Lean lords. A bank always get paid. Let me say that again. Banks always get paid. They may not get paid today. They may not get paid tomorrow. You may have to do a loan modification or you might have to wait to get paid. You might, it might be in forbearance for six months or a year, but you'll get paid because you get paid because guess what? You have the lien on the property. And if you did a good job of underwriting that note and that for that borrower, it's just a matter of when you're going to get paid. However, yeah. you switch to the other side of the equation. I think we learned this lesson over the last year, landlords, landlords may not get paid. If you're in a moratorium yeah. on evictions, yeah. there's no financial responsibility yeah. to the, for the, of the tenant to the landlord to ever pay. Now, who, who, would, have, who would have thought that was ever going to happen, right? Who would have thought the government would step in and say, you don't have to pay. Absolutely. What? I mean, so these, <laughs> guess who the, so we know the landlord model, right? And we don't not going to sure. get into that right now, but guess what? Who do, who do most landlords, what do they do? They leverage the leverage the deal. They go get a bank loan. That's the Burr yeah. method or whatever it is that they go. Yeah. And, do, and the bank right? got paid, didn't they? The they, bank well, got they're going to get paid. <laughs> I already yeah. made that point, right? The banks will get paid. Now, will they give some forbearance to the, to the, to the, the landlord? Absolutely. Because banks don't want the properties back. Yeah. Banks don't want to own. 
We already know that they want to control. They don't want to foreclose. Yeah. So that's where I think like foreclosures, for example, I don't, I think the banks are a lot smarter now uh, in general. They won't, they will not go down the foreclosure process like they did in the past. What I think they'll do is if they have non-performing notes, for example, they'll just sell the notes. They'll just get it off their books and they'll just, they'll keep it going some other way. They will not be the ones that actually go and foreclose. And here's the problem that, that borrowers that are in that situation are going to run into. There's a lot of ruthless people out there that, that can own and control notes that uh, aren't going to be as lenient as a bank or as patient waiting to get their money as a traditional right. bank would, right? right. Yeah. They're not going to want to offer you a loan modification. Banks win when they loan modify because guess what they do? They just move that money to the back end of the note and mm -hmm. they're getting amortized payments, which is a huge thing. So I didn't want to get off on a tangent on that, but you're asking what I think is going to happen. I think we won't see the foreclosures like we have because here's the th here's what's different today than than it was before. Yeah. Even if a person's in a distress situation, okay, what they most likely have is they have equity in their property, right? They Correct. didn't have that back, you know. Then they weren't loaned 125 percent of the value like California. Correct. Did. Right. Correct. Right. So if they if they were underwritten correctly, and I think the banks did learn from the mistakes back in 2008, they probably have a pretty good solid loan to value written yep. on that deal. And look what the market's done. Just just if they wrote anything in the last 10 years, those the rates have been low. So that means the principal payment is greater relative to the Correct. total payment. So that's going to drive the principal balance down, which, yeah. which helps. And but well, so you got appreciation value, happening right now. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of people that I see out there because we talk to sellers all the time that are in distress, distress situations. And it's like, they, they own a house worth $300,000 now, and they only owe $200,000. They have a hundred thousand dollars of equity in it, but they don't have a job and they need money to pay bills. And their only exit's going to be is the sell and go someplace else. And because there's no other way that they're going to free up that, that cash, it's yeah. dead equity in those houses. And they can't do it any other way that at least that I'm not that I'm aware of, but the really sell, because they're not going to be able to go get a refinance. They don't have the right the credit, the back. Yeah. All that. So that piece of it's going to come in. So, but no one's going to, I shouldn't say no one, not many people are going to let somebody foreclose on a $300,000 house that they only owe $200,000 on. Right. Why wouldn't they just go sell it for 250? Right. Right. Or, 40 or right. anything. Right. But right. The foreclosure is the last thing they want to have happen. Yeah. So I think that is likely going to happen, which is going to be a huge opportunity for people that know how to creatively structure the deals. Right. Figure out how do you get a, how do you get the seller? How do you pay the seller for some of their equity and control that deal? And figure out how to make it work and that's a whole nother another call. amber and i started our business in 2008 so we started 2007 we bought our first house slipped in 08 so we we were grinding all this time so we know that mark we went through that we started in that market and went through it so we really had a good a good taste of it and people have asked you know what what do we think is going to happen is going to be bigger than last time i said i don't think so it's not, I, because i think last time yeah crisis. it's not a real estate crisis per se it's a crisis just in general we have inflation happening right now and a lot of yeah. the world's crazy like, right now but i mean i i can't predict the future either no but... none of us can right none of us know but but i think being prepared in whatever whatever vehicle you choose like you said whether you're in the note business whether you're in the wholesale business you're in the flipping business they're in the rental whatever whatever business you're in in real estate you got to be prepared Right for your side, you got to yeah. get ready because there will be opportunity that comes out of this. Just like you 100%. said, there will be opportunity. Hundred percent. So you know, it's a matter of of saying how do how do I attack it? But for, I for you, whatever my, word, my, I want to attack. My it. real estate cycle has dropped down to about sixty days now. So I'm looking at everything in a sixty day window. I mean, if I'm going to acquire something that I need, to, I want to make sure that I'm I'm exited out right. in sixty days. So that means I'm not going and buying high end fix and flips, for example. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to play musical chairs and be the one left standing without the chair. Right? <laughs> That's I'm, right. Yeah. I've been there and I've done that. So yeah. there's plenty of other ways that you can, you just can't be greedy. Right. I mean, you got to be able to something, you know, sometimes you win baseball games with lots of singles and doubles. That's how you, that's how you mostly win them. Right. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah for so sure. that's why I do the model that I do so that I, at the end of this day, when I do this, I might not make as much money today, but I like the fact that I'm going to have some cash now. I'm going to have some cash flow. And yeah. guess what I'm also going to get? I'm going to get a payday at some point in the future because even though I'm writing a 30-year term on that note, the, the, the probability that note goes 30 years is extremely low. Right. Uh, the higher probability is that note is going to get paid off probably between seven and 10 years. That's the note. Okay. So seven, 10 years. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's so you it know, you, you seven know. it's closer to 10 depends on who you ask. A lot of people aren't, aren't, aren't leaving now. They refinanced, they got cheap interest rates. They don't have any other place to go. Yeah. They've already remodeled. So they're going to stay a, a little bit longer, but guess what I get? So if you understand amortization and you run an amortization table, I get all my interest on the front side. So let's just take that 30,000, Let's just take that thirty thousand uh, dollar. I think was it thirty? It was twenty. Twenty eighty. I got to get one. It's twenty thousand dollars second lien. Correct. So I'm going to get a ten percent interest on twenty thousand dollars. I'm going to get two thousand dollars a year, right? Yeah. Get two thousand, two thousand, two thousand, two thousand. In ten years from now, I got twenty thousand dollars, right, in cash. But that's not all, because when that borrower calls the bank for the payoff. Who's the bank? I'm the bank, right? Because I'm the bank, I'm the lien holder and they call for a payoff. I go to my amortization schedules. I run my amortization schedule and I don't know the exact number of this. So don't say that he doesn't know what he's talking about. I just don't have an amortization schedule in front of me, but that 10, that $20,000 loan at 10% that was written 10 years ago, that's coming, getting called today is still going to have a balance of probably $17,000. Sure. Right. Sure, well, yeah. who gets that money? That's the payoff. I get that money too. Right. I get a little bit of cash when I did the deal. I get cash flow for as long as the payments are made. And then I get a nice lump sum check that just shows up in the mailbox for another $17,000. So in that little bitty example, and that's not even the examples that we do. It's just easy math for me to calculate it. But, you know, what does that come out to be? $5,000 cash, uh, $20,000 in cash flow. Yep. And another seventeen thousand dollars. What is that? Forty thousand, almost forty thousand yep. dollars on a seventy, on a sixty thousand dollar purchase. Yeah. And you're oh. not getting nailed with taxes because I mean oh. you're it's it's stressed out. So you're not getting yeah, nailed with it. Out. I do most of that in my IRA anyway. That's a whole other discussion, sure. right? Sure. And that's, that I will. That's a great point because most people do not know that they can invest their i their self directed IRAs and buy be the bank, right? Be a lender. You can't do it for yourself, but you can do it for other people like yourself. that. You can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't go do your own, but you can surely be a lender on it and right. be the lien holder on it and create the paper. Yeah. You can go buy notes. All those that all those 500 notes that I told you I did the wrong way. Guess who the buyers are on most of those? There are people that had money in IRAs. Yeah. They're ecstatic about what they got because it's, oh, yeah. it was a great investment. So they got an and investment just, back backed yeah. by a piece of real estate, right? So exactly. it's pretty great. That's exactly the key. That's pretty great. Well, I'd say, I think yeah. as we're wrapping up, it's great for people to know that there's a lot of other exit strategies out there, not just what, what you, what you know, right? You think, again, if you're a wholesale, we, we do wholesale, we do fix and flips, we do a lot of rentals, we do short-term rentals. That's kind of what we specialize in, in our, in our businesses. So we, we do all that, but it's great to know, we do some private lending, but it's great to know, Hey, there's other options out there for, you know, lending money. If people want to find you, Nick, how do they, how do people reach out and find you, connect with you and yeah. find you on social? How do they find you? Yeah. You know, there's uh, if, I think the best place to go is go to, go to USA note pro.com USA note N O T E pro.com. That's our, uh, one of our primary websites from there. You can see there's a bunch of, uh, you know, recordings and YouTube and podcasts. There's educational stuff on, there's a couple free eBooks that talks about, you know, buying notes and creating notes a little bit, but there's a beauty of this. Even though what we do is complex, I mean, it's not difficult, it's just complex, right? But you don't have to, this isn't done by you. And when I mean by you, I don't, I don't underwrite the borrower. That's a third party service. That's a third party RMLO. Yeah. I don't, I don't create the, I don't run the servicing. That's a third party servicing. I don't create the loan documents that need to be, that need to be created for the closing. That's the time. That's the attorney. The yeah. title company does a the title. There's just different people in the process. Yeah. I'm not, I don't do anything but just orchestrate the deal. But the most important part and where the true value comes in is when you do it yourself, you know the entire process. And, but when you buy the note, it gets a little bit more tricky. But that's what we do. We educate people on how to buy notes because you don't have to do any of this to invest in, in mortgage notes to be the bank. You can go buy them. Just like you can go buy a real estate property, you can buy right. a mortgage note. 
and do the same thing. And that's that's always a good place to start as well. So check out usanopro.com. My, my email's on there. If I can answer any questions or anybody's got a deal that they think might make sense from a creative deal structuring standpoint, happy to talk to them. Because here's the thing, you know, what happens when you want to offer, like I said, in the initial net, what if the borrower owed $85,000 on that first example we talked about? Right. I mean, is there, even if you offered them $80,000, are they going to take that deal? Probably not because very hard to get somebody to write a check and yeah. give up a property. Sure. However, if I can give them some cash now and some cash later, yep. you know, maybe yep. give them some and, and control that property by leaving their, their debt in place, for example, sure. I can get them yep. their price, do yeah. it all the time. And, you know, that's what we can do on the creative deal structure. Everybody wins. Yeah. Seller wins because they get their asking price. We win because we get something that we weren't going to have before. And whoever got the deal brought in, they get paid on it as well. So. Yeah. Tell us this as we wrap up. So we are a real estate of mind show. We, we're big believers that you can't make the, co the coin and cash. You get your head right, right? So you just got to figure out this. And you have challenges every day, no doubt about it. As we're getting to know each other, I'm sure you've been through ups and downs. How, sure. do, how, do you, how does Nick maintain himself mentally through all the ups and downs of, of being a successful entrepreneur? Well, look, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, have uh, a lot of faith, you know, in, in God. I mean, that's a big part of what I do, but, but, but it's not part of my business plan. Uh, hope and praying is not on my P and L statement. I can promise no, you. No, not at all. Not okay. At all. And it is on a lot of people and you can't, you know, you have to be, uh, you have to, you know, you have to surround yourself with people that, that, that are trustworthy and that have actually done the work, not talk about doing it, but actually done it and yeah. have a proven track record that you can do. And you can't, and I have to be extremely transparent on what I, what I'm, you know, all my, all my, success is is also has a lot to do with my failures right and my oh, failures sure. aren't necessarily financial failures it's just like man i could have done that a little bit better i should have thought about this and that's why i go back to the educational side because when you're an entrepreneur especially in the real estate space you're on an island by yourself a lot of times right you are. you're handling that whole deal from acquisition to disposition and there's a lot of steps in that process and if you're trying to do all that yourself individually uh, you run the risk of making mistakes. You be, yeah. run the risk of being inefficient. Uh, and time is the biggest is the biggest obstacle in this whole thing. And velocity is what you need to achieve by getting the deals done quicker. So you have to be able to leverage it. And that's where I go back and I always say, and probably the biggest thing for me is the educational piece, honestly, because by being part of people that are like-minded and have proven success and be able to do that in a think tank environment and just be able to do that when, you know, when you go to an office, you have other people around and you can share ideas and stuff. You don't get that. You don't get that opportunity when you're, when you're a real, a real estate entrepreneur, yeah, you got to create sure. it yourself. That's for sure. Well, awesome. That's great stuff. Nick, thanks so much for being here today. We learned a lot. Appreciate it. Awesome. And our listeners are probably going, wow. Hadn't thought about all that. It's a lot of information. Well, that's just it. Well, that's play like, it back twice. <laughs> well, you know what, but you know what, if any, if whether they do anything like this, oh, it gets them thinking about, there's more than one way to get to Chicago, right? Yeah, you exactly. got to figure out what's the best way for you. But more importantly, just get there, right? Yep. Get there and figure out what that looks like and utilize resources that are available to you to you to get to get that done. You know, utilize people like myself or you or anybody else. Most people that are really successful, they do, they, they, they love sharing and they love helping other people be successful because it's one of the best satisfactions that I get by showing you how to do a deal. I can't tell you how many low equity, negative, low equity, no equity, and negative equity deals we've been able to creatively deal structure where it's a win, win, win for everybody. And that's ultimately what I enjoy doing the most. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I think there's so many different personality types out there. And, and not every personality is a good fit for one as one aspect of real estate or the other. So if this you know, resonated with any of the, the listeners yeah. that are wanting to get, you Take know, that find this interesting. Yeah. Look, look you're not look going to see it on, there. Hey, you're not going to see it on HGTV. I can tell you right. that. No, exactly. they don't discuss these deals. Do they not? Not yeah, at, they don't, at all. Doesn't, it does not look pretty on camera. I can tell you that. No, I know. Yeah. Well, Nick, thanks for being here today. I appreciate it. Everybody, thanks for listening to the Real Estate of Mind show. Remember, Nick talked a lot about education. As you know, we put on the Home Flipping Workshop. You can go to homeflippingworkshop.com and check out our upcoming workshop. We also run the REI Marketplace, which is a nationwide RIA where we actually meet 
uh, virtually, and we actually network virtually in and out of breakout rooms. It's a very cool system we put together. So if you want to kind of connect and and, uh, and meet once a month and be around high level industry experts. So you're not alone out there. So you're not alone out yeah. there, right? So you can talk, yes. not, not just read a book and not just be in a blog and not just, you know, talk and chat, but actually physically face-to-face -face talk. We've Iron sharpens iron. COVID has taught us a lot about uh, technology and how to use it to our advantage. And we are jumping all over that. So we're doing that too. You can also go to glennandamber.com and follow us, our charity work and all that kind of stuff we do too. So we'd love to have you do that and follow anything we do. So again, Nick, thanks for being here and everybody. Thanks for listening. All right, today. Glenn Amber. Thanks again. Talk to you guys soon. <laughs> all right. See you on the next episode.